Here it comes. The return of the great American dream machine. Here are highlights from the 1971-72 award-winning series of The Great American Dream Machine. myself a small business and just trying to make a living. If I can make a living, that's perfect. Not trying to get rich, honey, just a living. If anybody wants any more than that, they're crazy. To be rich. That's what the American dream is about, is unlimited greed. To be successful. Probably lots of money. <laughs> I think I'd like to come into a lot of money. Probably the American dream is to make money. Material success. Half a million dollars. Half a million dollars. Success, I guess. I don't know. You say American dream, I just think success. All the money in the world and a bike. Money. I've been around this countryside and met some folks I'd lift my cup to. It ain't true that only midgets have somebody to look up to. And when I find someone with guts who's got a dream that's kind of nuts, I don't care if his IQ is next to zero. I just stick out my right hand and say I'm proud to meet a man who we all can call a great American hero. Blaze started out in a tumble-down shack. She had no diamond necklace, just some rags on her back. Well, I was born in West Virginia. My real name is Fanny Bell Fleming. Out playing with the fellers, she'd go shoot a squirrel. And then one day, she realized that she was a girl. And I enjoyed it. it I had a, a wonderful childhood. I loved every minute of it. And life was a drag, so she packed up her bag and went out to look for employment. And down came a zipper and out came a stripper and since then it's been pure enjoyment. And that head on her shoulders that none was concerned with meant more in the end than her chest meant. She put it to use, and that's what she earned with, and went down to Wall Street and made her investment. 
Well, when I started work on the uh, block, Mr. Goodman said that I should invest a certain amount of money in stocks every week. So I did, and I bought a few of this and a few of that. And over the years, they sort of, um, I just didn't sell anything. And over the years, it amounted to quite a bit of money. Polaroid, U.S. Steel, King's Department Store. She bought them low, she sold them high, and then she bought some more. The dividends kept pouring in, the prices hit the ceiling. This one wants me to help it, and that one wants me to help it. Different organizations, the Cancer Fund and the Heart Fund and the Riding Parade. So, well, this cheers me up a little. And besides, it made television. That's business, too, you know. <coughs> Walter Reed Army Hospital is really my favorite, um, where I give parties at the club for the soldiers. Play stories are doing a wonderful thing for veterans. I think it ought to be done everywhere. And I called Blaze and I said, would you just come up to the party and say hello to us? And she says, well, I won't do that, but if you'll bring them down to the club, well, I'll close the club for two hours and throw a party at the club. And I said, Blaze, you're crazy. This is Saturday night. And she said, uh, well, they didn't ask what night it was when they got hurt. I don't decide who is to attend the party. The uh, recreation people handle that. The ones that are able to attend and the ones can drink without getting sick. I mean, it's just a fantastic experience, and she's one of the most fantastic people I ever met. All right, fellas, there's no restrictions. The doors are locked, the police are outside, and you're on your own. So on with the orgy! It's showtime, and there they go undressing. Showtime, and we're drooling in our beer. No time has come as such a blessing. It's awful nice a place to have us here. And we all like her down here because she is trying to help the block out and the people and the citizens. We do come down here. Got the best place on the block, no troubles. I haven't had no complaints at her place since I've been here. The style of work she does is very pleasing to the public, very pleasing to the press, and very pleasing to everybody concerned. She's showing the veterans where they belong and bringing them back alive where they were dead. We got girls in our laps. Champagne in our tummy. We may be disabled, but we still can get chummy. It sure beats a Saturday night of gin rummy. So let's go on with the show. Okay, everybody, back on the bus. Time to go. What a lovely day it's been. It's too bad it had to end. And she gave us each a kiss. As we sleep, we'll dream of this. And the chance we'll meet again sends a tingle through each nerve. It's so hard to say au revoir. So let's just say au revoir. This is America, and it's out there to get. And anyone that don't go out and, uh, you know, become uh, wealthy or partly wealthy, it's their own fault. You have to take what you have and make the best of it. I take what I have and I made the best of it. Catherine Moss, she became her own boss. And that's where you'll find her these days. She'll keep buying stock till she owns the whole block. You sure gotta hand it to Blaze over the counter. You sure gotta hand it to Blaze. Oh, damn these soap suds. <laughs> The Bureau of the Census has recently released population figures that indicate New York State is smaller in relation to California than it was 10 years ago and will therefore lose two representatives in Congress. California will gain two. New York politicians are talking as though this were a sad occasion and Californians seem to think it's a joyous one for them. What I'd like to know is, why does everyone always assume that bigger is better? 
Why, does every mother with a child, every country, every city, every business, every school, every everything, think the bigger it gets, the better it'll be? The companies making the new small cars are telling us that their small car is bigger than the other company's small car. We're obsessed with big when it ought to be apparent to all of us that small is better. I suppose there are some things, but I don't just offhand recall anything that got a lot better as it got bigger. For instance, I've known a lot of good little restaurants around New York. Sooner or later, they get successful, buy the place next door, expand into it. That's the end of the restaurant being either good or little. The Metropolitan Museum of Art has great expansion plans. You can't get around the whole thing in one day now on roller skates. Why do they want to make it any bigger? I've got nothing against Alaska or Hawaii either, but I haven't noticed any big improvement in the United States since the Union was enlarged to include them. I went to a college that keeps writing to tell me how badly they need money if they're going to continue their expansion program. Never seems to occur to them to stop expanding. But I don't like to be negative all the time, so I have a proposal, a positive plan. How about a five-year plan for the United States? The theme would be diminish or die, and we'd all pledge ourselves to making things smaller and better. Here in the city, we could take down an occasional skyscraper and turn it into a vacant lot. Not a parking lot, a vacant lot. Under the plan, any large corporation that set out to unconglomerate would be rewarded. The government might even help companies to keep from growing by providing Washington-trained inefficiency experts. Teeny tiny would be our goal for everything. Huge, gigantic, and colossal would be the ambition of the ignorant. With time and hard work, we could reduce everything in the world to manageable size again. Of course, it's going to take a really big effort. I am terribly flat-chested and really need help. Several months ago, I started wearing falsies, and this has made my popularity rating soar but I have a guilty conscience now and would like to stop wearing them, but I can't because too many people would notice the sudden change in my appearance. Therefore, I can only quit wearing them when I have developed my bust somewhat. Mother, may I go out dancing? Your desire to wear falsies and your present desire to get rid of these artificial contrivances is quite understandable. Our beauty editor recommends you grasp a telephone directory or any heavy book in both hands and raise the elbows to shoulder level, pressing the book constantly with palms and fingers. Lift it slowly over your head and as far back as possible. Do this exercise 20 times first and work up to 40. Have patience, be persistent, and give yourself six months for results. If you find in time that there is no medical help for your condition, I still would not despair. Fellows rarely date and ultimately marry a girl just because she is curvy. Most likely the popularity that you now enjoy is because you are less self-conscious and therefore more free and natural in your behavior. cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak or forever hold his peace. Do you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? I do. Do you take this man to be your lawful wedded husband? I do. In accordance with the authority vested in me, I now pronounce you man and wife. fashioned that way. I don't believe in group sex and free um, sex. I believe in the old-fashioned cheating, up the back stairs, in the back way of hotels, nice hotels. (laughs) Um, No, I don't think adultery is bad. Uh, As many psychiatrists have said, adultery keeps more marriages together, Uh, possibly only if you're caught. 
First of all, you must always respect the spouse. Uh, you must not do anything to hurt him. You never leave telltale traces. Never admit to the ABCs of adultery if you are participating. Even if you're not and you're accused, I just um, deny, deny until the end. <laughs> If my husband were having an affair, or it, or possibly is having an affair, I would hope he was doing it in good taste. I'd like to get a bracelet, please. Diamond, of course. There we are. Now, is this something like we have in mind? Or perhaps this? Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. I'll take that. Fine. To tell you the truth, that's my preference. Now, will there be anything else? No, thank you. Oh, yes, yes. I want to get something for my wife, too. <laughs> if my husband told me he had an affair and he was happy and made him so very happy, I'd say, very well, pack your things and get going. I know I only burned up about 600 running five miles, but during an adulterous sexual relationship, uh, you burn up about 900 calories. So what would you do? I would you throw them out or would you keep them? No, I'd keep them. They were smart I, I, till I, I got somebody else myself. Because it's a mistake and it's a <laughs> problem and it, it has to be filled. Uh, I, I, I don't go along with it. And no, I don't. Either. I don't believe I it. I definitely am a because I feel that if 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 I can't satisfy my husband right. and he's having an affair, then we better look into our relationship Absolutely. to begin I with. I agree, Florence. Yes, I think you can. I don't think you're going to forget it. Time. I think time, time takes care of that. You think he would understand? He would. Yeah. He would. Yes. I think so. I would too. I, 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 I might that be that able to. <laughs> I never so. put myself in that position. It would be a very deep hurt. Yeah. It's a very hurting and thing. The and, the, and the hurt can stay with you a very a long, long, long time. Yes. time. And right. if it's just a passing affair, right. then uh, right. Betty, there's no such thing as no. a passing well, affair. Well, if it's right. the one affair that you learn about, you hope it's a passing affair in it. Don't trust. And <laughs> I, I have to trust. trust. I trust. Well, we must trust. Well, I think I if it was handed it. to a man, I don't think there's a man alive that would refuse it, regardless well, of how faithful he is. I, know. I think I they agree. would be very tempted to try. That when my husband and I try, yes, but not to have an affair. No, well, if he would, if he would be with a girl, that should be an affair. But that's only a one-time shot. But that's still an affair. That's one time. But it can be a one-time affair. Oh, come on. Have you ever been tempted? Uh, have we ever been tempted? Have oh, I that I must say, tempted? yes. Yes. Yes, I have been. Mm -hmm. Doorbell. <laughs> Adultery is mostly the fault of the woman where it regards the man. Because a man has to be kept in good condition. He has to be kept peaceful. And the woman gets sloppy, pays no attention to him, so he drifts off in another direction and finds something that suits his appetite. You don't think much of women, do you, Felix? Oh, I love them. Every last one of them. But they're all the same. They want a romance. There's nothing romantic about the slob they see shaving in his pajamas. You and me, Larry, we're furniture in our own homes. But if we go next door, aha, next door, we're heroes. <laughs> relationship you'd probably be better off taking sandwiches up to the room if you wanted to keep it quiet i don't believe in adultery adultery's trouble mm -hmm. 
I don't think there's one woman that could actually satisfy a man. Once upon a time, I was married to a chess player. And we were married on a Saturday, and on Sunday, he was at the chess club. And for the next three years, we spent seven nights a week at the chess club. And every night, he read himself to sleep with a chess book. Now, what would you do if you were married to a man like that? An adulterous person is someone that has an illicit relationship with another person while they're... I don't know. That's ridiculous. That's old-fashioned. This is uh, 1971, man. I mean, this is, you know, a new world. That's all you have to say to me? Have a nice bed? What do you want me to say? I don't know. How about I love you? You've had three weeks to think about it. No commitments? No commitments. No strings attached? Mm -mm. If I meet another chick and I want to split, uh, no hysterical scenes? Mm -hmm. I love you. Make us some coffee, baby. Am I the first guy you ever really loved? The first I ever really loved. Who's the first guy you ever made it with? What kind of a question is that? Hey, we're adults. I realize I'm not the first guy in your life. I realize there are guys uh, before me, and I realize after we split, there'll be guys after me. I mean, I know where it's at. The important thing is that right now, I'm the only one. So let's be cool and just have no secrets. I was 15. It was my girlfriend's father. Cream and sugar, right? Fifteen? I mean, isn't that uh, kind of young? I mean, this old guy forced you to... He wait. wasn't old. He was 35. Uh, you know, this has been a traumatic experience. Oh, not really. Your girlfriend's father rapes you? and He didn't something? rape me. I came on very strong with him. He was fantastic looking. But it, it must have been a traumatic experience. Oh, well, you mean it, it changed my life. 
uh, it was very beautiful. Is that what you mean by uh, traumatic? No. W what do you mean? Never mind. We were just so turned on to each other. I said never mind. Are you upset? I'm not upset, but you have to admit it's pretty weird for a, a girl to, to make it uh, at 15 with her, with her girlfriend's father, uh, you know, and she wasn't even in love with him. Well, I loved him, physically. I mean, I, I roared like an animal when he made love to me. I mean, I didn't even uh, make love with a woman until I was 17 years old. And then it was uh, not a married woman. I mean, it was a very lovely uh, widow. Her husband passed away in the war. He was a very dear friend of the family, and I was uh, comforting her. Why don't we her change the subject? I mean, it's old news. I was very promiscuous when I was young, but that's all over with. You're the last man in my life. Isn't that the important thing? Yes. Who was the second one? Oh, who remembers? I remember. I remember my second one. She was a lovely, sweet, young, clean-cut cheerleader. I met her in my sophomore year in college. We shared certain sensitivities, certain awarenesses. We would take long walks in the park. Why do you or... want to put yourself through all this? I'm not putting myself through anything. I just like to have everything on the table. I like to have an open, honest relationship. Don't you want an open, honest relationship? I was 16. He was 24. Uh-huh. He was a fireman. Uh-huh. He was bisexual. Uh-huh. But he was a beautiful person. A bisexual? Mm-hmm. A fireman. Mm -hmm. you, you made it at 16 with a bisexual fireman. Of course, he had certain perversions. But they weren't perversions to me. I don't judge. You're lying to me. All right, I'm lying. Well, if you're not lying to me, and you did roar like an animal and participate in certain perversions, then, then it, it's sick. I mean, it's really sick. Okay. You want honesty? You want all the gory details? No, I don't want gory details. I just want names. I didn't get their names. It all happened so quickly. There were these eight furniture movers from Grand Rapids, and there were... Uh, a group of Shriners uh, okay. who got me drunk. Okay. And the boiler crew from the SS Constitutional. Okay, I got the joke. The Vienna Boys Choir. All the right. Moise Ballet. Right. Very funny, very the funny. The NFL. You are sick! You're a sicko! I'm a sincere guy who only has meaningful affairs, and you are a sick, lying, promiscuous whore sicko! I was kidding, Herbie. Herbie, come on. Where are you going? Herbie, you hurt me when you said you'd split if you met another girl. You really hurt me. Oh, then you're lying. You mean I hurt you because I said I... I might split with another girl. That, that's why you got so hysterical? Did you lie? It depends. Are you going to split Did if you, you meet another girl? Did you lie? Are you going to split? Did you lie? Are you going to split? No! Did you lie? Of course! Of course I lied. Of 
course you lied. What do you put yourself through that for? I knew you were lying. That's what made me angry. If you had done it, I could understand. My philosophy encompasses everything. It's just the lying that, 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 that makes me hurt. Herbie, you forgive me. Ah, you got it. Come on, come on, let's, let's go to sleep. You must be knocked out. So, uh, who was the third one? graduating class, as the dean of your university, it's not only my honor but my pleasure to welcome each class as it arrives, and as today, to bid them farewell. The degree itself demand, you know, brings uh, respect. It lets me know that uh, I can go out there and I know everything, just about. Well, of course, I'm going to hang this thing up over my desk. A beginning inventory is an inventory that starts the first day of the month or the first day of the week, or even the first time in the morning is your beginning inventory. And the correct answers to the inventory problems are, and it will list them. Professor Berry, just how successful has the system proven to be? A key to completing this successfully is that they have more of the basic understanding of a beverage yield or a fry yield or something of this sort. They get a better understanding of why, if your meat versus buns is off, why it's off, and where, what areas to look for that it should be corrected in. Uh, Professor Doran, is this really an academic subject? Hamburgers? I think so. Okay, the system we're going to teach you is what we call the 12-12 system. And it simply means we're going to be cooking uh, patties in runs of 12. The onions are put on as soon as the patties are laid. This is because they are dehydrated onions and they need time to reconstitute. Just using a hammer-like motion over the patties. The need for the special skills, the involvement, the knowledge, the competitiveness that does exist. I think that you as a graduating class, going out to join those thousands of others that have graduated before you, I think you understand this. Okay, you notice this first patty is starting to get a little dark around the edge and you can see meat juice is starting to come through. You'll know that this is when the patty is almost ready to churn. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. And what was the toughest part of this course for you? Well, I thought running the hamburgers, trying to meet the demands of the production, trying to keep the bin full up here. Getting used to the meat systems, of course, and uh, the uh, working with the buns. Basic refrigeration uh, really snowed me. It was very important to me to come here. I've waited since I was 15. I kind of wanted to get in this business. I started then, and this is kind of the big first step. I suggest to you, and for your personal insight, that you're about to join a highly specialized e-life. I myself laughed when I was first told about it. Do you have any special rotation for turning the meat on the grill? Yes, you should, you should turn it in the same order that they go down. What did this course mean to you? What kind of knowledge are you bringing back to Canada? It's a first step for me, because I wanted to get my uh, next step next year, which will be for uh, the other course they're offering, and after that I'll take my uh, doctorate. Uh, Dean White, uh, this is uh, an age when uh, university administrators have all kinds of difficulty. There's money problems, student revolt, and so on. Now, you uh, run a very special university. Do you have any of these problems? 
I don't have the problems that Hayakawa has on the coast, of course. Uh, at this present time, we don't foresee any. This is an autonomous gathering here, purely controlled by the professors at the university. What is campus life like at uh, Hamburger University? Cold. <laughs> <laughs> Very cold. Well, uh, usually after classes, guys go for dinner and then a few drinks and they usually get in about 10 o'clock and finish the rest of their work and then go to bed. But we've got some guys around here that uh, keep walking down the halls and climbing out windows and what have you. I mean, it's a regular panic around here. Contrary to public opinion, the hot dog is not the most common sandwich in the United States. The hamburger is. Making hamburgers, as most people think, they just figure you put a piece of meat on and you flip it around and you have it prepared. But for McDonald's, it's sort of an art. One of the things a good manager does is every morning he taste tests each of his products to make sure that what he's serving to his customers is correct. So while we have all these hamburgers cooked, why doesn't everybody try one? And I think that your role in society is cut out for you. And that role is leadership. I ask you to use it well. Secretary Treasurer and Director of R.D. Brown, Inc. for 42 years. Catherine Mary Duvall. Hey, do Burns. Time I've been a farmer's wife. Okay. Needless to say, your committee is happy and delighted to have this wonderful turnout. Some 70 of you, including 29 members who survived <laughs> of the class of 1921. We'll have the invocation by John Cox, Sr. of the class of 21, followed with the singing of two verses of America and the LHS loyalty song with Dorothy Reinhardt at the piano. Now that was the serious one. Now this is going to have to be a little happier. Catherine Putin Blackwell. My husband's a contractor. I'm just a housewife. Mary Hoffman Kincaid. <clears throat> I, we lived on the farm for a while, and then we got into the Chrysler automobile business, which we are still in. Ralph W. Stark, newspaperman for six years, a Lebanon stationer for 34 years, and now a genealogist and historical researcher. Let her roll, Dorothy. <laughs> oh, I'm not Elizabeth Garner, remember. I'm sorry. <clears throat> the flu epidemic of 1918. Now, look right here. That's fine, good. I'm Lillian Johnson Grease. I have been a public health nurse for almost 40 years. Jeanette Bush, I'm an attorney. 
Fariva Hadley, yeah, he home economist with Purdue for 16 years in food service. Mary Johnson Byrne, I'm a housewife, and I have three, two sons and three grandchildren, all boys. Me, Clyde Trivet. I'm more or less retired, a pharmacist, have been all my life. Boyfriend, they didn't usually take you to the show. They meet you. They afterwards. would meet you afterwards, you know, and walk <laughs> home with you part of the way home. All you had to do was buy a nickel package of chewing gum, and you had it made. Home. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd McDonald uh, graduated here. The farmer been in a rural land appraiser for the last forty years. Preston Plu retired. Lives in Indianapolis. Getting ready to go to Florida. Byron Corey, practiced in dentistry for 46 years. Retired Lieutenant Colonel, AUS. Herbert Gregg, delivery boy for grocery, mayor of Lebanon, 1947. Retired from the Indiana Gas Company. Mildred Shanklin, and I have uh, had four children that they all went through Lebanon High School. I've been uh, associated uh, with direct selling for the last 21 years. Those plays we worked on for weeks and weeks, Catch a Coo, Oh Oh Cindy, and many others. We had a director all the way from Chicago, Mr. Darfler. How the girls all fell for him. Then we learned he was married. Then there was the class play. A pair of sixes. I was the stenographer and John Cox was the office boy. And do you remember the kid party that we had in those last days of our senior year? Do you know we girls put on short dresses? While our class hasn't produced a national president, a U.S. senator, or a state governor, we have had three mayors, we have had one dentist, at least two lawyers, a minister, a number of businessmen and women, several school teachers, some farmers. Lauren Garner, and uh, we have three children. I retired after 42 years. Uh, Wallace H. Bond, uh, I've been married 46 years. I retired uh, from Libby McNeil and Libby, the food packers, four years ago. We moved to Florida three years ago. I live in St. Petersburg, but we love it down there. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Again, when I was in this Lebanon high school, as a boy 19, 20 years old, I think my dream was to be a good citizen, to have a good life, and to acquire a decent and fair measure of success. And I think I have realized that dream. I'm sure. <laughs>
Uh-huh. A little happiness? Good. Okay, the system we're going to teach you is what we call the 12-12 system. And it simply means we're going to be cooking uh, patties in runs of 12. The onions are put on as soon as the patties are laid. This is because they are dehydrated onions and they need time to reconstitute. Just using a hammer-like motion over the patties. The need for the special skills, the involvement, the knowledge, competitiveness that does exist. I think that you as a graduating class, going out to join those thousands of others that have graduated before you, I think you understand this. Okay, you notice this first patty is starting to get a little dark around the edge and you can see meat juice is starting to come through. You'll know that this is when the patty is almost ready to turn. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. And what was the toughest part of this course for you? Well, I thought running the hamburgers, trying to meet the demands of the production, trying to keep the bin full up here. Getting used to the meat systems, of course, and uh, the uh, working with the bun. Basic refrigeration uh, really snowed me. It was very important to me to come here. I've waited since I was 15. I've kind of wanted to get in this business. I started then, and this is kind of the big first step. I suggest to you, and for your personal insight, that you're about to join a highly specialized e-life. I myself laughed when I was first told about it. Do you have any special rotation for turning the meat on the grill? Yes, you should, you should turn it in the same order that they go down. What did this course mean to you? What kind of knowledge are you bringing back to Canada? It's a first step for me, because I want to get my uh, next step next year, which will be for uh, the other course they're offering, and after that I'll take my uh, doctorate. 